This video is kindly sponsored by Brilliant, the place to improve your skills in science, maths, and computer science. What do you think is the largest threat the atmosphere poses to you right now? As in, how would the atmosphere be most likely to kill you? Climate change? Hurricane? Storm? Drought? The answer is none of those things, by quite some distance. The World Health Organization estimates that 7 million people die every single year due to air pollution. And let's put that number in context. On this graph, what do you think these other causes of deaths per year are compared to air pollution? If you guessed terrorism, war, road accidents, and obesity, you'd be right. According to the World Health Organization, air pollution kills 70% as many people as all cancers combined. And it's worth noting that other organizations estimate the death toll to be even higher. Now, you may be hearing this and thinking, well, this is a problem for low-income countries. Statistically, if you're watching this video, you're from a high-income country. And perhaps think that this isn't a problem that affects you. But guess on this graph where you think people are exposed to what the World Health Organization determines to be high levels of air pollution. Deep red would indicate the majority of the population of a country, while yellow would indicate a low proportion. Go ahead, guess. Perhaps you're expecting to see a cluster of red countries in West Africa, Southeast Asia, you know, big population centers, with the rest being yellow. Well, how about... 95% of the world's population is exposed to mean annual levels of air pollution that exceed World Health Organization guidelines. This isn't a low-income country problem. This is a global problem. So what is air pollution? How does it affect us? And how can we fix this problem? Firstly, it's important to draw a distinction between indoor and outdoor air pollution. My house doesn't have a fireplace. Sorry. Indoor air pollution is caused by the burning of solid fuels, such as coal, charcoal, wood, even dung, for cooking and for heating, indoors. Quite obviously, doing so fills the air with soot, with carbon monoxide, with various other compounds, and especially in poorly ventilated spaces, that has a huge impact on respiratory health. But solid fuels are predominantly used in lower income countries. As a country economically develops, it tends to phase out the indoor use of solid fuels in favour of more expensive, but cleaner, natural gas and electric systems for heating and for cooking. As billions of people have been lifted out of poverty in the last few decades, the number of deaths due to indoor air pollution have plummeted, from approximately 100 deaths per 100,000 people in 1990 to just over 30 deaths per 100,000 in 2019. Unfortunately, however, over the same time period, the death rate from outdoor air pollution has stayed the same. Why? Outdoor air pollution is a different beast to indoor air pollution. Instead of being caused by one type of fuel being burned for basically two purposes, its sources are diverse. And while it's comprised of multiple different components in the air, its impact on health can be summarized by just one, particulate matter. In simple terms, particulate matter refers to liquid droplets and tiny solid particles suspended in the air. We categorize them by size, with coarse particles being between 10 and 2.5 microns across, and fine particles being less than 2.5 microns in diameter. Coarse particles are largely formed from natural processes, dust from deserts and sea foam. But they're also created through some man-made processes too, like dust kicked up from roads. They aren't exactly good for you, they can get deep inside your lungs and cause problems, but they're not the real troublemakers. Those would be the fine particles. Being mostly droplets of things like sulfates, nitrates, and ammonium ions less than 2.5 microns across, fine particulate matter when breathed in can penetrate the lung barrier and enter the blood system. In 2016, 58% of all premature deaths caused by outdoor air pollution were due to coronary artery disease and stroke, both caused by fine particulate matter. Even in low concentrations, small particulate pollution has been shown to not only take years off people's lives, but also have a large effect on quality of life while they're still living. It's described as the world's leading environmental health risk factor. This, again, is a global problem. So fine particulate pollution is the deadly component of outdoor air pollution. 
But what creates it? What do we need to remove in order to potentially save millions of lives every year? And why am I talking about it? The answer is pretty much one word. Combustion. Fine particle pollution is, like coarse particle pollution, a mix of natural and man-made particles. The majority, however, comes from humans burning stuff, specifically burning fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas. Remember how earlier I said that as countries economically develop, they've reduced their death rate from indoor air pollution by not burning solid fuels? Those countries power their economic development by burning more fuel overall. They just do it outdoors. And those countries tend to use more energy-dense fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, which boosts the economy, sure, but unfortunately also boosts the death rate due to outdoor air pollution. Up to a point. More on that in a bit. Wait a minute. The burning of fossil fuels is causing a massive environmental problem. Where have I heard this before? Hey, I've seen this one. I've seen this one. This is a classic. What do you mean you've seen this? It's brand new. In 2019, I was lucky enough to see former Secretary General of the United Nations ban the man, Ki-moon, address a conference on renewable energy in Seoul. He gave a powerful address about air pollution that ultimately sparked the idea for this video. Unfortunately, I don't have the text of what he said in Seoul, but in 2007, while Secretary General, he addressed the Commission on Sustainable Development, saying, Closely linked to climate change and energy is the issue of industrial development. Over the past several decades, industrial development has been central to the growth and poverty reduction achieved in many Asian countries, and it remains a leading aspiration of other developing countries. Air pollution is an unhappy byproduct of industrial development and energy use. Energy, climate change, industrial development, and air pollution are critical items on the international agenda. Addressing them in unison creates many win-win opportunities. The climate crisis and air pollution are in many ways two sides of the same coin, both caused by humans burning fossil fuels, and ultimately caused by humans wanting a higher quality of life. Perhaps I don't say this on this channel enough, but people aren't emitting carbon into the Earth's atmosphere for fun or out of spite. They're doing it because they want a more comfortable, wealthier life. And that needs more energy. Unfortunately, something that historically has necessitated the burning of fossil fuels. Unfortunately, that has caused the premature deaths of a lot of people through air pollution. The use of fossil fuels is responsible for between 30 and 40% of the direct disease burden of outdoor air pollution, depending on who you ask. It's estimated that over 3.6 million deaths a year could be prevented by the direct and indirect impacts of a phase-out of fossil fuels. To put that in context, that's like saving the lives of everyone in Uruguay every single year. And to be clear, that's not even taking into account preventing the incredibly difficult to quantify deaths that would occur in the future with a changed climate due to us burning fossil fuels. At the very least, though, we're talking about saving millions of lives every year. But how do we do that? We can't simply tell people to stop trying to make their lives better or grow their country's economy. Humans should have the right to self-improvement. Well, the answer lies in what I hinted at earlier. Look at this graph. This graph shows the death rate due to outdoor air pollution versus the gross domestic product per capita, a metric of how developed an economy is. As economies develop using more fossil fuels, the death rate increases to a maximum in middle-income countries, and then decreases in high-income countries. Why does this happen? Because in the last few decades, highly developed economies have invested in nuclear and renewable energy generation and electrification of many processes, such as, for example, transport. This has reduced the burning of fossil fuels and thus improved air quality in those countries, though, as we saw at the start, not to a level that can be considered safe just yet. Okay, so to improve global air quality and save millions of lives, all we need to do is get people to stop using fossil fuels and get them on board with the renewable energy transition, right? Two problems, one physical, one practical. The physical problem is that, bizarrely, outdoor air pollution is actually helping us in the fight against climate change. 
You see, most of the polluting particles that are suspended in the air, largely sulfates, are reflecting away some sunlight that would otherwise reach and warm the Earth's surface. The IPCC estimates that these reflective sulfates cool the planet by about 0.8 degrees Celsius. So while the planet has warmed by about 1.1 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times, if it wasn't for the reflective properties of air pollution, it would have warmed by more like 1.9 degrees. So removing those particles from the atmosphere by not emitting them anymore is actually going to cause the planet to warm quite quickly. The practical problem is, of course, that historically only high-income countries have been able to afford nuclear and renewable energy. It's all well and good telling a low-income country that they could save lives and improve their economy by using solar power, but if coal is cheaper, they're not in a negotiating position. That's their ticket out of poverty. Bringing down emissions of greenhouse gases and saving millions of lives a year, then, is a bit more complicated than just use more renewable energy. To prevent a spike in warming, widespread reductions in fossil fuel usage needs to be matched with similarly rapid reductions in methane emissions, largely from agriculture and waste management, which would produce a rapid cooling effect to counteract the rapid warming effect caused by removing those reflective sulfates from the atmosphere. Studies have no, the science has been done, all right? We know what's going to happen. This isn't an excuse to not do this. Furthermore, while renewables are now cheaper than coal, making them the most attractive option for new electricity generation, if low- and middle-income countries are going to revolutionise their energy grids, their transportation networks, how their homes use energy, they're going to need money. Extensive climate finance from the global north to the global south is going to be essential to removing the world's dependence on fossil fuels. And it needs to be on the agenda at COP27 in Egypt this year. And, you know, we'll go quite some distance to helping right the historic wrong that those countries least responsible for the climate crisis are the ones most affected by and least able to mitigate the effects of it. <laughs> Smells like sustainable development. And for those of you wondering about nuclear power, go watch my video on why nuclear is complicated in this context. The point, however, is that we have a really good understanding of the world's leading environmental health risk factor, outdoor air pollution. We understand what it is, small particulate matter, where it comes from, natural and man-made sources, the latter largely being due to combustion, and how we can prevent millions of deaths every year rapidly phasing out the use of fossil fuels. Of course, it just so happens that doing so is also exactly what we need to do to prevent catastrophic climate change this century. As Ban the Man said, tackling both these global problems at the same time is a win-win. But what if this was a problem in isolation? What if there were no climate component of burning fossil fuels and just an immense public health problem? So let's say, um, hypothetically, that there was no climate crisis and that the Earth's temperature is unchanged by our activities. Let's say that happens. But the burning of fossil fuels is causing the air that we breathe to slowly kill us, and that by not acting, we are allowing a country the size of Poland to be killed every single decade. Is it moral to not act on this problem? This global problem? A global problem that we know how to solve. At the start of this video, I asked you what you thought the largest threat the atmosphere posed to you was. And you probably got it wrong. And that's because humans suck, I mean generally, but specifically, at large numbers. We're just wired to deal with small numbers of people and relatively simple systems. Neither of which are good descriptions for anything in the modern world. To understand anything on regional, national, or global scales, which is to say to understand any system in the 21st century, you need to use statistics. And that's not something the human brain understands on its own. Fortunately, an extensive, expertly written, beautifully illustrated course on statistics is available on Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is a website and app that improves your skills in maths, science, and computer science by introducing you to new ideas and immediately getting you to apply them. They offer courses from middle school level to graduate school level across subjects as diverse as statistics, machine learning, and quantum mechanics. Crucially, Brilliant emphasizes that the objective is to try not 
necessarily to be correct. Because if you get something wrong, then what happens? You just learn from the experience, you improve for next time. If you're in full-time education, Brilliant offers an alternative resource to the classroom, shedding light on subjects from a different angle. While if you're in the big scary adult world, ah! Brilliant offers the chance to improve your scientific thinking and problem-solving skills, and be introduced to new subjects like statistics. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, or click the link in the description. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, for themselves or for a student in their life. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and for being, well, you know, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching to the end. I really hope that you took something away from this video. It's a subject that I really enjoyed delving into in much more detail than I had previously. And um, yeah, as I hope you took away from this video, it's pretty shocking, right? If you'd like a recommendation of what to view next, then here's some stuff up here. You can also sign up for Brilliant or subscribe to the channel just below me. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. In a different studio, this was temporary. <laughs>